Robin Lyonga can't believe what he has just been told. A single cow, many miles from here, has foot and mouth disease. The abattoir has been closed, and although Robin's cattle are healthy, he can no longer sell his animals for the money his family desperately needs. When it comes to animal products, powerful trading countries subject Robin and millions of other cattle farmers like him to unreasonable demands. Robin needs to sell his cattle to the export market because that is where he can get the best price. But to get his animals to the export accredited abattoir requires much time and effort. Because he cannot afford transport, he has to herd his cattle on foot for nearly four days to reach the nearest quarantine camp. His cattle then have to stay in the quarantine camp for three weeks. Robin lives in the Caprivi region of northern Namibia. Here, green floodplains are grazed by large herds of wildlife. The scenic rivers and wetlands harbor an incredible array of water-dependent animals and birds. But beyond the rivers, the land is semi-arid. The climate is harsh and the rains unpredictable. Thousands of people live in small villages, scratching out a living by farming this semi-arid land. Most depend on maize, fish, and wild plants for food. Their cattle are too valuable to eat. Because of poverty, poaching was once widespread. Local people hunted many species to near extinction. The Namibian government responded to this crisis. They persuaded rural communities to become involved in nature conservation, to form conservancies, and to earn money from sustainable use of their wildlife and natural environment. Five years ago, Robin Lyonga became an active member of the Mashi Conservancy. For many days, he walked from village to village, convincing people in his community to join the conservancy and commit to a new way of life with environmental conservation as a priority. The then young Mashi Conservancy began to make headway through the efforts of Robin and others like him. It all made sense to Robin. Protecting the environment ensures a long-term future for his children. But he soon learned, wildlife business will not fully support everyone. Farming, and especially cattle farming, is equally vital. Almost all the families here have cattle. It's in their culture, a centuries-old tradition and economic lifeline. Two national parks, now teeming with wildlife, surround Robin's village. Robin's house lies on an invisible boundary. Every day, when he and his family take their cattle to graze, they have to respect the boundary line. The rule is simple. The grass on this side is for the cattle. On the other side, it's for the wild animals. Cattle are wealth for farmers like Robin. They represent a bank account, a retirement policy, and education for the children. Selling a cow or ox supplements their income when times are tough. It always has. <laughs> so it was a long process establishing the Marshy Conservancy convincing farmers of the advantages of conserving wildlife. 
15 game guards were chosen from the community to protect the wildlife. Yeah. We've got two spores. Two do spores and yeah. some... This is a zebra spore. Yeah. Yeah. People in the community had to agree to stop poaching. The guards were given the authority to confiscate snares and prosecute yeah. offenders. The Marshy Conservancy is part of a much larger master plan. Five countries connected by the Zambezi and Okavango river systems will create one of the largest conservation areas in the world. The Kavango Zambezi Transfrontier Conservation Area is blessed with extraordinary numbers and diversity of wildlife and includes major wetlands such as the Okavango Delta. It is a sanctuary to about 250,000 elephants, the largest population in the world. Tourists from all over the world come to this region to experience the vast unspoilt wilderness and spectacular wildlife. The government assisted the conservancy by releasing more game into the area. Luxury game lodges are licensed to operate in Mashi. In exchange, they pay a percentage of their revenues to the conservancy. Campsites were set up for more adventurous tourists. All this activity created employment, but not enough. So for Robin, there is a difficulty. Who should get a job and who not? The money is definitely not enough. At the first annual meeting, members make it clear that they experience very little direct benefit from the conservancy. How can management receive money, but the rest of the community so little? If the management can't raise enough funds, then we should appoint new people. <laughs> but there is some progress. The community decides to pull income and buy a vehicle. Robin becomes the proud driver of the new pickup. Soon, sick people are being taken to the clinic and the old are transported where they need to go. For the women making crafts, the vehicle has become a lifeline. They can now display their wares in a kiosk on the main road where many tourists visit and spend money. Life has started to change in Mashi. Game numbers are on the increase. The free movement of animals enables cattle and wild buffalo to graze and drink water together. Unfortunately, healthy buffalo are able to transmit food and mouth disease viruses to cattle. Buffalo herds maintain these viruses continuously. The viruses have no effect on the buffalo, but cause disease when the cattle are infected. Foot and mouth disease is a feared, but badly misunderstood disease. In reality, it is a mild disease that rarely kills livestock and does not infect people. Its massive impact relates to outdated international trade practices. With wildlife numbers increasing, the government grants the Mashi Conservancy their first hunting quota. A limited number of game animals are offered to international hunters who are only too happy to pay handsomely for the experience and their trophies. After the hunt, the hunters help to distribute the meat among the members of the Conservancy. 
For many, it will be their first taste of fresh meat in a long time. At the next annual general meeting, tangible evidence of the conservancy starting to deliver benefits becomes clear. But Robin knows it is still not enough to adequately change their lives. Even within his own family, he realizes that drastic measures are needed to lift themselves out of poverty. Robin's brother Dan works as a cleaner at a lodge. He wants to become a tourist guide and earn a better salary. But to do that, he must be qualified. The course is very expensive and I'll have to stop working while doing my studies. Robin decided to call a family meeting to discuss raising money for Dan. If we slaughter and sell cattle as meat, we will get 1,200 Namibian dollars per ox. If we sell them live to local traders, we could get 1,500 Namibian dollars. 3.6. But if we take them to the quarantine camp, we might be able to get 3,500 Namibian dollars per ox. Robin went back to Dan with the news that his family had agreed to sell some of their cattle to pay for the conservation course he needs to do. <laughs> so, it came to pass that Robin set off on his journey, happy to go through all the rigmarole if it can improve Dan's life. The extended stay in the quarantine camp came to an end. That morning, veterinary services did a final check and certified his animals healthy and free from foot and mouth disease. And Robin was waiting for the truck from the abattoir to load his animals. But it was then that the quarantine master gave him the shocking news. A single cow, 150 kilometers away, has foot and mouth disease. The abattoir will no longer buy cattle from anywhere in the region. In fact, it will close for several months. But why are we, here in the quarantine camp, punished for a sick cow many miles from here? No one in the entire region will now be able to move their cattle. Even Robin's healthy cattle are locked into the quarantine camp and will now have to stay here for months. That is what the rules based on geographic management of foot and mouth disease require. The high-value beef markets around the world tell Robin and millions of other African farmers that they cannot trade their beef if they live in areas that are not recognized as free from foot and mouth disease. To do that in the Caprivi, where Robin lives, would mean getting rid of all the buffalo. Also, fences would need to be built around the Caprivi to keep the buffalo from surrounding countries out. But fences would seriously damage their conservation efforts. And buffalo are an important species for their growing ecotourism industry. There is currently no way to free the buffalo herds from the viruses that cause foot and mouth disease. Fortunately, the World Organization for Animal Health has introduced a standard to make it possible for farmers like Robin to trade their beef. This standard does not require geographic freedom from foot and mouth disease. 
But powerful countries ignore the new standard and continue to insist on geographical zoning. This long-standing requirement for disease-free zones has forced countries in Southern Africa to erect enormously long and environmentally damaging veterinary cordon fences. The result is devastating. In an effort to trade, they have had to separate wildlife populations that maintain foot and mouth viruses from cattle raising areas. The result has been that natural migration routes needed by wild animals to reach seasonal water sources and grazing have been blocked and wildlife numbers have dwindled. To counter this loss in biodiversity, 14 transfrontier conservation areas have been or are being established in southern Africa. The movement is an effort to conserve some of the world's most valuable remaining wilderness and wildlife areas. The objective is to remove some of the fences in order to re-establish natural wildlife movements across international boundaries. It is an exciting development for conservation, but it has huge consequences for cattle farmers like Robin, who want to sell their cattle for a good price. But if all the countries accept the non-geographic standard, a new world would open up for millions of farmers like Robin. According to this standard, the important requirements are that foot and mouth disease must not have occurred within a 10 kilometer radius of Robin's village in the last 30 days. His cattle must be vaccinated regularly against foot and mouth disease. Most importantly, quarantine is no longer required, but Robin must transport his cattle by disinfected vehicle directly to the approved abattoir. At the abattoir, his cattle need to undergo inspection before and after slaughter to ensure they are healthy. After slaughtering, the beef must be matured for at least 24 hours to ensure the pH falls below 6.0. The beef also needs to be deboned and lymph nodes removed. It's a scientific fact, matured deboned beef with a pH value of less than 6, is safe and cannot spread foot and mouth disease. Regulations that concentrate on the safety of the product itself will be far more effective in preventing the spread of diseases across international boundaries. Robin's matured deboned beef is safe and therefore it is irrelevant whether his cattle come from an area where buffalo are present. Imagine if Robin and his community were paid international prices for their natural beef at the same time as they were conserving wildlife, our priceless heritage. Then, there will be money for Dan and other young people to go to school and even college. Cattle farmers will have an interest in improved disease control. Local communities will be positive about conservation. The better they protect the wildlife, the more income it will generate. All but one of the pieces of this imagined future are in place. The conservation areas are underway. The private sector is engaged. The approved abattoir is in place. The international market for beef is vibrant. All that is missing is powerful countries that refuse to trade beef according to scientifically founded international trade rules. still insist on production practices 
that have environmentally disastrous effects on some of the world's most irreplaceable habitats. Robin Lyonga is a conservationist and a cattle farmer. He and his community produce healthy cattle in harmony with nature and international standards. They more than deserve the benefits of their conservation efforts and the fruit of their labor.